Hey SAT fam, welcome to your digital SAT classroom. My name is Jin Bei, and I'll be your teacher, your coach, and your trainer throughout this course. Now guys, um, what I want to do first, right, in this short intro video, is I want to first kind of explain what this course is, and also what this course isn't. Okay, so by the title, right, this course is a practice test course for only the writing questions. Now what does this mean? Well, let me explain. So this, what this course does cover, you guys, it does cover the four released practice tests right, by College Board. You can just download it for free on the College Board website. There's four released practice exams for the digital SAT test. So this course will cover those four practice tests. Each practice test has two sections. These sections are called modules, right? One module one and module two. Now each module has 33 questions in it, and so a total of 66 questions, right, per practice test, and these 66 questions will combine both reading and writing questions, okay? So what this course offers, though, is this course offers the, the explanations for every single practice test question for only the writing section. So it doesn't include, right, any answer explanations for the reading portion, right, of these tests. So you might be wondering to yourself, oh, and by the way, the writing questions uh, are typically the second half of each module, right? So typically around question number 18 and 19 is when the writing section of each module kind of begins. Now, if you're familiar with the previous SAT, like you know that there was one separate section for reading and one separate section for writing. Well, this new digital SAT kind of combines both styles of questions in each section, okay? And so just making sure that that's clear to everyone, this course explains just the writing questions for the practice tests that are released by College Board. So this is where I know you guys are probably thinking, well, hey, why, right? Why the heck, right, do I want to or do I even need this course then, right? If I can just download these practice tests online for free, and if I can just download the answer explanations to these practice tests on the College Board website for free, right, why would I need this course? And I understand those questions or those concerns, so that's why I want to spend the rest of this video kind of answering that question, why? But I want to answer this question why on multiple levels, right? So why, why you, right? Why should you and your child, right, get or purchase this course? And the simple answer to that question is, well, this course isn't for everybody. I designed this course for a certain type of avatar, a certain type of student, which I'll talk about in just a second. The secondly is, well, why me, right? Who am I, right, to kind of teach or provide this service for you guys. Talk a little bit about myself, right, and why I'm perfectly designed, right, to teach this course. And lastly is why this, right? Why purchase just a course for only the writing section when you can purchase courses, right, that combine both the reading and the writing sections, right? And so I will hopefully, right, try to explain, right, um, answers to those why questions that you guys might have. So first of all, you guys, right, in terms of, uh, I want to first start off by kind of saying that, listen, not all explanations are created equally. They're not all created equal. So what do I mean by this? Well, imagine, guys, you had like four or five people, right, kind of giving you, right, an explanation for the same topic, right? Well, some person, right, you might understand better than others. You know, some people might use certain words that might resonate with you better, Right? Other people might have an explanation style that's harder to follow. Other people might use words that are more verbose, harder to understand. Right? So really, that's the whole point, is we can be talking about the same thing, right? but not all explanations are going to be received the same way, right? by the same person. You know? And so the point that I want to make here, you guys, is you know, you can, if you just download, download the answer explanations that the College Board provides, Right? And I've kind of presented you one. This is one answer explanation that the College Board provides for one of the grammar questions on their practice test. 
Okay, and I want you guys to kind of read this. You can pause the video now and just kind of read it, right? To really try to figure out, well, hey, does this answer explanation really help? Okay. So here, this is basically the College Board explaining why answer choice B is going to be correct. It says B is the best choice. The convention being tested is punctuation use between a main clause and a supplementary phrase. Pause for a second right there. Well, what's a main clause? Right? What's a supplementary phrase? How do I tell? You know, how can I identify? How can I train myself right, to identify what these things are? Right? And also, what are the characteristics of a supplementary phrase? What are the characteristics of a main clause? Right? Do I even know how to look for that? Start to kind of understand right, the problem with this. It says, in this choice, a colon is correctly used to mark the boundary between the main clause and the supplementary phrase, and to introduce the following explanation of the origin of Earth's continents. Basically, what this answer explanation just said is they're saying, well, answer choice B is right because it correctly follows whatever grammar concept they're being tested. So it correctly follows this grammar concept, the grammar concept of a colon. In other words, it's basically just saying, hey, B is right because it correctly uses colons. Okay? Now, if you look at you know, the answer explanations that the College Board provides right, for the wrong answers, and I think this is wonderful, right? That the College Board not only explains what's right, but they also try to explain what's wrong. Okay, now you're also going to find problems with this as well, right? So if you, if you, I'm just, I'll read kind of part of it. So they're saying choice A is incorrect because it fails to mark the boundary between the main clause and the supplementary phrase. They're basically saying, hey, A is wrong because it's wrong. A is wrong because it fails to follow this grammar rule. <laughs> so, Choice C is a little bit better. Choice C says, it, choice C is incorrect because a semicolon cannot be used in this way to join the main clause and the supplementary phrase. A semicolon is conventionally used to join two main clauses, whereas a colon is conventionally used to introduce an element that explains or amplifies the information in the preceding clause, making it the better choice in this context. It's a little bit better because they tell you what a semicolon or how a semicolon can be used, but can you still tell like the language is being used? Conventionally used to introduce an element that explains or amplifies the information in the preceding clause. Because what does that mean to you, right? Now, if you're, you know, if you're fluent in the English language, you can still kind of tell, right, that this language is very vague. It's very, it uses words that are more obtuse, abstract. It's not tangible or concrete, right? Um, so you can kind of tell, and choice B is terrible. Choice B basically just says it's, it's wrong because it's wrong. Right? Choice D is incorrect because it results in a rhetorically unacceptable se sentence fragment beginning with geological. Right? Um, and so basically the language used in the College Board's explanations of their answers right, is not only very unclear, yeah, and, and you know, this language is very vague, right? it's very obtuse or abstract, and oftentimes when you use unclear language like this, right, an element that explains or amplifies the information in the preceding clause, when you use language like this, especially to a teenager, the teenager is going to end up being more confused and frustrated. Okay? Not to mention you guys, yeah? how helpful right, do you think this wording is? Not very, right? If you read this explanation, right, you ask yourself the question, well, what, what can I do with this? Right, how do I use this? Right, if you think about it, you guys, yeah, again, not all explanations are created equal. Right, the explanations you know, that College Board provides right, is just kind of explaining that you know, A is correct, right, and that B or whatever, the others are wrong. Right, a good explanation will not, you know, a good explanation won't just kind of explain that something is right and that things are wrong but instead it's going to kind of explain why it's right or why it's wrong and how and how to right um, how to look for specific things right to so that you won't fall into the same trap so that you won't make the same mistake for future questions that are testing you on similar concepts you know i think that's what great explanations do Great explanations don't just explain that, but they also explain why it's wrong and why it's right, yeah, and what specifically these things are, what specifically a main clause is, what the characteristics are, and also how to identify it, 
what you should do to train yourself to be able to better recognize it, how you should read the question in the first place, and what are some things you got to be aware of so that in the future you don't make the same mistake. I think great explanations will do that. Yeah, and I just, I really fail to see how College Board's explanations really provide you with, right, the explanations that you need. The clear, concrete ones that you need that are actually going to help you, that actually teach you, right, how to kind of like figure things out so that, you know, you don't make the same mistake in the future. And I think, guys, one of my core principles of teaching, right, um, is not just, I don't just want to feed you guys fish. I want to teach you guys how how to fish, right? So it's, it's a sort of, um, you know, biblical um, sort of sort of a story. It's, you know, I can just kind of sit here and, and, and explain to you guys that, you know, whatever B is right and the others are wrong, but I don't want to just do that, right? What I want to do is I want to go further. I want to help you guys actually understand what you guys need to so you guys can kind of train or understand yourselves and apply these things yourselves, right? I want you guys to learn how to fish. I want you guys to be able to kind of think through these questions on your own so that you don't need a sort of me type of figure, right, to understand why something is right and why something is wrong, is all, okay? And that's really what the sort of second part, right, of this video explanation is really about, right? Why me, right? Who am I, right, to kind of sit here and tell you guys that I'm the right person for y'all, right? Um, well, here's my attempt at doing that, you guys. Uh, so I am, again, my name is Jin. Jin Bay, um, and, and I am a one percenter you know, in all things grammar. So whether this is, whether you're talking about the SAT, the old SAT, um, the 1600 version, the 2400 version, back to the 1600 version, back to this, you know, digital SAT, you know, over to the ACT, as well as the GMAT exams. When it comes to anything grammar, you guys, yeah, I can kind of just transparently tell you guys I am in the 99th percentile when it comes to just all and anything grammar, you know. Um, so I do have that sort of skill set, right, where I'm very accomplished in this thing, but I don't think that's what really makes a great teacher. I think what makes a great teacher, right, is the sort of experience, right, that a person has. So I have over 20 years of experience, right, working with students in personal levels, in classroom, in small group levels, in classroom levels, all the way to hundreds of people, right, in sort of lecture style, uh, lecture style settings. Um, I've spent the last 12 years of my life living and working in Seoul, right? I'm working with over 7,000 Korean students of all different ages, right? And all different ability levels, right? And have you guys ever heard that sort of saying? Um, well, maybe I'm sure you guys probably haven't, but there's a saying out there in the education industry that, you know, there's a difference between a teacher who's been teaching for 10 years and a teacher who has 10 years of teaching experience, right? And so, a lot of the teachers that I've seen in Seoul, or just in, 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 just in the world, right, um, even they've just been teaching for 10 years, right? So what that basically means is they only really have one year of teaching experience. It's that first year when they're trying to figure out their curriculum, right, when they're trying to uh, figure out exactly what they want to teach. That's the only year of experience that they really have. The rest of the nine years is they teach the exact same thing in the exact same way. And if the student doesn't understand, it's their fault, not the teacher's fault, right? So I've seen, that's the vast majority, right, of teachers in this world. You know, it's, it's a sad reality, but e even in public schools and private schools, it's the same case, right? On the other hand, there's a small percentage of people, and I truly believe that I fall into this category, of teachers who actually have 10 plus years, whatever, 12 years, 20 years of actual teaching experience. Now, what does that mean? Every single year, I'm trying to get better. Every single year, right, I'm trying to do things differently, right, to reach people in different ways. So there's like 10 different ways that can explain the exact same thing, right? Well, that comes from experience, right? I'm always trying to figure out, well, hey, how can I take this bucket of students who don't know, right, about something and really put them into this second bucket, right, of students who do kind of understand, right? And there's many different ways you can explain something to a person. You can explain it to them visually. Or you can explain to them auditorily. Or you can explain to them kinesthetically, right? Through like touch and feel, right? And so it's, it's always this sort of like never ending constant improvement, right? Of trying to be able to reach students, right? Reach more and more students though, right? And kind of have a better impact on them, right? So that they can kind of learn and they can kind of have academic success, right? Whatever that means to, to them. 
And so I really believe that I'm kind of in that category, right, of, of teachers, you guys, yeah? And this sort of, that's the sort of one percenters, too, I think, um, the ones who really tries to um, make themselves vulnerable, right? They, they open themselves up to embarrassment because it sometimes can be humiliating, trying something out, making, you know, and, and failing. Um, but really, it's that vulnerability that's going to allow you to kind of connect and reach, you know, people that you otherwise wouldn't have if you stay, you know, if you just stay so rigid, right, with just one teaching curriculum and one material is all. And so I think that's what really makes me kind of uniquely qualified, right, to kind of work or, you know, help whoever's out there, right, listening to this right now. Not to mention, you guys, yeah, I am very, very accomplished, though, right, when it comes to test prep. So I have literally spent, right, literally analyzed, observed, you know, studied over 10,000 actual test questions, whether this is from the SAT, the GMAT, or the ACT, right? This is taking hundreds of actual test questions and analyzing it, right? Not to mention I'm an author or content creator, so I've literally created thousands of practice test questions based off of of, right, the ways that these test companies, right, make test questions, yeah, for at the high school level, you know, um, to get into the college, whatever, to get into U.S. university is all. And so understanding that, right, understanding, being able, uh, having observed, studied, and analyzed over 10,000 actual test questions, right, it really changes the way that you kind of look at, right, grammar, especially in the context of like the SAT, you know, and so you'll start to kind of understand that, right? When you watch my lessons or my lectures, when I explain a, when I explain a question, it's very, very, very different, right, from most other teachers um, if your child has had right, previous experience before. But that's, I believe, right, <clears throat> what makes me kind of uniquely qualified, right, to, 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 to teach you, to, to, to teach you and, and your child, right, um, throughout this course. Um, it's that not only that I'm just accomplished in that sort of field or that medium, but it's also because, right, I just really care about, right, being able to kind of connect and reach, like have as many students as possible, kind of understand, right, um, and have academic success, in this case, when it comes to English grammar. Now, um, as I mentioned before, you guys, right, this course isn't really for everyone. I've designed this course for a specific type of avatar, right, and so... I had this one specific type of student in mind, right, uh, when creating this course. And I call this student the untrained test taker. So what does that mean? What are some of the characteristics of an untrained test taker? Well, untrained test takers have had some previous, <laughs> that's, that's my special effect, Un untrained test takers, these guys have had some prior test prep experience. So they have enrolled in Hagwans or worked with teachers privately, right, for like the SSAT or even maybe for the SAT, right, for the older SAT, the paper-based test. But these guys, they really struggle to improve, right, their English scores, okay? These guys also lack a lot of confidence when it comes to grammar, right? And this leads them to be very, very uncertain about the answers that they choose. So there's a survey that I always ask my kids, you know, when I'm kind of solving questions with them, I say, hey guys, on a scale of one to 10, right? Like how confident were you about the answer that you chose, right? Most responses, most of the time, right? For, especially for the lower levels, I'll get like a four or a five. I'll also ask another question, right? Is like, hey, on a scale of one to 10, you guys, how confident are you with the English language, right? Especially with grammar. And the majority of responses that I get, it doesn't matter if, if, if it's the highest level students, right, the Shichun B kids, or whether it's the Kenyan or the concept class kids, right, I will get the majority of times something below a five, right? Uh, some people have given me a negative thousand, <laughs> a negative three, a zero, you know, that stuff kind of makes me sad, but it also, you know, it's a little bit of a lighthearted response to, you know, but I know that there's a lot of students out there who don't have confidence when it comes to grammar, right? So these are students who end up just choosing answers based on feelings, right? The victim chogoro, as opposed to based on facts, right? Based on gr actual grammar knowledge and rules, right? So this course is designed for that type of student. Also, these guys, they do have some grammar knowledge, maybe usually because, right, they have some test prep experience, right? But the way they've been taught grammar from whatever other test prep 
you know, it, it's not um, it's not strong enough, right? Like they don't emphasize the right things enough, right? Which really, um, which really leaves this type of student with what I call like a sur only a surface level knowledge, right, of grammar. So these guys don't know grammar well enough, right? They have somewhat of an idea, but they don't know the grammar rules well enough to be able to get 95 out of 100 questions correct. Right for grammar style questions, and I really think that, especially you know, for students that I've trained for over three, four, five, six months, these guys are able to get 98 to 99 percent of the grammar questions correct. Right, especially if I have that sort of one-on-one -on -one type of treatment with them, these guys won't miss grammar questions almost always. Right, they'll get those correct is all, and it's because I kind of train grammar in a certain way. Um, there's a sort of, again, a teaching philosophy that I have, you guys, yeah, is I want you guys, I want all of my students to learn grammar so well that they make it theirs. Right, is what, is what I kind of say, right? Is, is if, you, if you haven't made it yours, you know, um, which requires a lot of self-studying, which requires a lot of like quizzing yourself, right? Which really requires a lot of thinking, testing yourself, right? You know, you have to learn grammar well enough to make it yours. Because right now, I promise you that the majority of students, right, these grammar rules are not theirs. They're mine. They're SATs, right? So you have to really study it and learn them, learn them well enough to make these concepts yours, right? And once you make them yours, no one can take it away from you, right? So you'll start to kind of like, if you truly understand grammar, you'll be able to solve any Right, level of difficulty grammar question, right, confidently and correctly, right, on this test, okay? And lastly, the last characteristic for these guys, they take too long. They take too long to solve grammar questions, okay? And so one of the biggest sort of concerns that I have from students who take the SAT is running out of time, running out of time, running out of time, right? And so, you know, my hypothesis, right, what I truly believe yeah, the reason that students lack time on the SAT isn't because they're a slow reader, isn't because, um, you know, it's not because they're a slow thinker, it's because they lack grammar mastery. Okay, and I promise you guys, I've seen this, I've seen this play out so many times with students that I've taught, thousands of students that I taught, is uh, once the student learns grammar rules, once the student has a mastery or firm understanding of grammar and grammar rules, Right, it solves all of their other time issues, right? So, and, and you know, once you kind of master the grammar fundamentals, a lot of these grammar questions, you know, take you 15, 10 seconds, right, 20 seconds, definitely under 30 seconds though. And because of the time that you save with the grammar questions, it gives you much more time, right, for reading comprehension style questions. Right, certain questions that take you longer because they have more steps. They, under, they, they require more logic and more kind of understanding right, of what you read, yeah? as opposed to just simply choosing answers based off of grammar rules right, that are given or applied. Okay? And this goes back to my point. I know I mentioned you guys, not, an, not all explanations are created equal. What's well, also true with questions as well. Not all questions are created equal. right? So certain, so even though you have 70 seconds per question, you shouldn't take 70 seconds for every single question. Some questions you should, you should only be, you should be done in 10 seconds. Other questions should take you about two minutes, maybe even three, right? But that's the thing, that's the idea, you guys. Yeah, the reason that students lack time is because they spend way too much time solving grammar questions. And that's because these guys don't have a firm understanding of grammar rules. They haven't made them theirs, is all. Right, and so this course is really designed, right, for this one specific avatar, yeah, is it? Now, the last point here, you guys, yeah, is why this course, right? Why buy a course, right, that only teaches you one part of the test? Well, guys, the reason why I firmly, I truly believe, right, is because, uh, now, well, let me actually preface this by saying that, <clears throat> You know, this course isn't going to be for everybody, right? There are, there's a small percentage of students, right, who can learn a lot, right, at once, right? So they can, they can, they can enroll in a traditional hagwan you know, and, and take a read, they can take eight hours of class, right? They, they have a four-hour test that they take, right? They're, they're taking reading and math and, uh, and the grammar portion, right? And then they're studying 200 vocab words a day, 
right? And they're, and they're doing it really, really well, but there's only such a small percentage of students though, right? And the small percentage of students actually, they, they do kind of increase their scores, right? By a lot, you know, especially when they're doing this, right? For two months, right? Kind of like box it, right? Is all. But for the vast majority of students, you guys, this is the traditional test prep model is it's just, it's too much. It's too much for them, right? So the, for me, I like to focus on, when I'm learning something, I like to focus on learning one thing at a time and learning that really, really well. Which is why I decided to kind of create this class, right, that's just only focused on the writing section. Because the writing section, you guys, is dense enough. There's, there's, two, there's already a lot of different things that you have to know about the writing section. There's like 15 different grammar concepts that you have to know about the writing section. And each grammar concept has, well, one grammar concept has like over 10, or 10 to 20 things that you have to know really well. Right, but most other ones have about like four or five things that you have to know. Yeah, you have to be able to kind of observe, right? Certain details are more important than other details. And I teach you guys processes, step-by-step -step methods to solving each of these style questions though, right? And so it's, it's already way too, it's already a lot of information that you have to be able to kind of understand or learn with just one section, right? And so that's really the biggest reason I created this course the way that I did. It's really to kind of go against, right? you know, the traditional model, you know, and I think that the traditional model's biggest problems, number one is overwhelm. Overwhelm is basically when you're given too much, when you're given too much, too soon. You know, you just, you have to do a reading section and the writing section, and then you have 100 vocab words that you have to learn. Then you take the math section, and you're doing this for eight to 10 hours a day, right? Again, only a very, very, very small percentage of students, right, can actually handle this and actually improve their scores. But for the vast majority of people, right, if you try to teach, if I try to teach, and think about it just from your own life experiences, you guys, if you try to learn 10 different things all at once, you, you forget all of them, right? But if you try to learn one thing at a time, and you learn that thing really, really well, it stays with you. So it's a much more effective way to learn, you guys, right, is with that sort of focused learning, as opposed to just like, hey, here's everything that you need to know and you do, it, you do the same thing every single day. It's just way, way too much too soon for the vast majority of people. Most students end up just learning nothing right by the end of four weeks. They just end up wasting their time yeah, because uh, they've just been overwhelmed with stuff though, is all, okay? And lastly, you guys, we have what are called inefficiencies, right? Inefficiencies are basically, right, they're spending the time, they're spending time on the wrong things. Right? And I think that the biggest, one of the biggest um, <clears throat> myths, one of the biggest myths about test prep, right, is really spending time focusing like on learning, memorizing vocab words. You know, traditional model, right, traditional test prep models is you study a hundred words a day, right? And the more words that you study each day, right, the better it is. It's not totally not true. And the reason why is because of opportunity costs of time. Right? Spending three to four hours a day just studying vocab so that you can pass a silly vocab quiz, right, is a very, it's a big waste of time. Instead, using those three to four hours to learn something else, right, why not using those three to four hours, three or four hours to learn grammar rules better to make them yours, right, why not using two of those hours, right, to uh, studying how to solve, right, sentence structure questions step by step. You know, it's, a, so, it's so much more of an efficient or an effective use of your time than just spending all, a lot of this time, right, memorizing words that you're most likely not gonna see right on your test. You know, and so, you know, it, there's a lot of inefficiencies when it comes to the traditional model of test prep, right? And how'd I get this number? Well, this number is based off of, you know, surveys that I've asked thousands of students, is on average, how many hours a day do you study your vocab words? And this is the sort of, uh, this is the sort of answer that I get, right? And most students are so worried about passing their vocab quiz right, that they're using most of their time and their energy on that as opposed to studying what really matters is all, you know, which I believe is super inefficient way to kind of learn. And lastly, you guys, in terms of inefficiencies, traditional models, right, traditional hagwans are traditional places, right, um, that teach test prep, they explain answers in the order, right, that the, answer that the answers appear on the test, right, so for example, They'll, they'll explain question number 18, then 19, then 20, 21, 22, just in order, in order. And I believe that's the wrong way to learn, okay? Instead, yeah, instead, well, that's the last point. <laughs> so instead, here, the way that I kind of explain the answers, right, the, the way that I explain the questions is I kind of group them. I chunk them based on type, based on question type or grammar concept, right? So think about it instead of kind of like using 
your brain in different ways, right? So for the first five minutes, you're using your brain learning about, you know, comma rules. And then for the next question, you're learning about something else. And the next question, you're learning about something else. And the next question, you're learning about something else. Your brain doesn't absorb or make those neural connections strong enough, right? Instead, you just have a very surface understanding and you're bouncing around from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing, though. It's a very inefficient or ineffective way to learn. Right, there's a psychological principle called chunking or grouping, where instead of just learning things randomly, right, you learn them in an organized way. We call these chunks. And the way that you chunk information on, the, on, on a practice test is really chunk it based on question type or concept. So for example, you know, one of the things you can chunk it is based on like, questions that test you on verbs. Right? Or sentence structure or you know, commas. So now we have like three or four questions that are based off of this one concept. And so now how students are actually learning, they're learning in an organized way. So they're learning about this one concept or one question type and they're seeing the different ways that the SAT can test you on this one concept. It's a much more organized and coherent way to learn. The information stays in students' minds a lot longer right, because their minds aren't bouncing around from one thing to another to another thing is all. Okay? And that's really um, why I kind of create this, created this course in the way that I did. Right? And so what ends up basically happening, yeah, is that students just end up working really, really hard, but not really improving their score as much, right? You know, and then, um, yeah, it's just oftentimes just a, and, and end up, it ends up being kind of a waste of time. So guys, this is all to kind of say is, look, um, I can't promise you that your child is going to get a perfect score on this test, right? But I do know that the results that I do kind of provide or give students goes beyond just like the superficial surface scores. You know, I've gotten hundreds of, of letters, personal letters from students really thanking me. Uh, and a lot of them do thank me for increased scores, but most of them, almost all of them thank me, right, for the psychological aspects, right, is really believing in them. You're helping them to, you know, be more confident, you know, when it comes to English grammar. Yeah, I'm not, you know, teaching them specific processes so they just don't know so they kind of move beyond just knowing that something is true to actually knowing how to actually solve something, right? And lastly, it's that sort of belief that, um, you know, I myself have in students, right, that really helps them to tap into their potential so that they can start believing in themselves, right? And so if these are the sort of effects or the sort of benefits that you would want, right, you, your child to kind of have you guys, yeah, I would love for you guys to start your journey with me, right, throughout this SAT course. Guys, thank you so much for listening to this short 30-minute intro video about this practice test class. Hope to see you guys in the actual classroom soon. Take care, you guys. Hey, SAT fam. You know, welcome to your DSAT, your Digital SAT Writing Foundations classroom. Uh, guys, my name is Jin. You guys can call me coach, teacher, trainer. I'm all of the above for you guys. Guys, what I really wanted to do in this class or for this course is really help you to master the grammar fundamentals to help take you from unstuck and unsure to unstoppable on the SAT exam. Now guys, what, I, what I'm going to do in this first practice test explanation video is I'm going to be dissecting yeah, for you guys the practice test that you guys downloaded and took right on the College Board website. Right? Currently, there are four uh, free right, downloadable uh, takeable practice exams, right, for the digital SAT test, except that these practice exams are not adaptive, right? They're, they're just linear, basically, right? In other words, they don't really adapt or change to how well you did that first, from that first section. Anyways, what I'm going to do in these lectures, you guys, yeah, something a little bit different, right? Now, there's a couple of sort of key points that I have to tell you guys about, like, logistically, okay? So, number one, you guys, remember, I'm only going to be covering the writing questions, from practice test one, module one, okay? So the writing questions, they begin from question number 19 on your test, okay? So the question that says, which choice completes the text so that it conforms to the conventions of standard English, right? That question number, right? Question number 19, that's when the writing section begins. Everything before that, right, are reading questions. Okay, I'm not going to be covering those in this course. This course is designed right, to really help you go deep on the writing or the grammar portion of this test. Right? 
really helping you guys, teaching you guys all the sort of facts and the strategies that you need to know about the grammar section to help you to get a perfect score, right, from this half of the test, okay? So that's number one, you guys. The second sort of key thing uh, that I want to point out to you guys is in this practice video, in this video, I'm not going to be explaining the questions in order. Okay, so in other words, I'm not going to be explaining question number 19, then 20, then 21, but instead, it's a much more effective way to learn, in my opinion, for my years of teaching, it's a much more effective way to learn, right, when you kind of learn in chunks or in groups. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I basically grouped together the different, you know, different questions, right, throughout the test that are based on the same concept or the same question type. There are different question types and different concepts that are tested on the SAT, right? So what I did was I just kind of like gathered all of them from practice test one, module one, right? And we're going to be kind of diving into that concept or those questions first, right? So in other words, your brain is going to be kind of thinking about, right, that sort of same concept. Right? And your brain's going to be kind of seeing the different ways that that one question type or concept is going to be tested, the different variations. Right? So in other words, you know, instead of your brain kind of jumping you know, around from like one question type, like going from verbs to commas to semicolons to run-on sentences to pronouns, right? instead it's just going to be focused fully on right, sentence structure. This is the different ways that the SAT can test you on this one particular concept, right? And you're going to start to see patterns and stuff, right? So we're going to kind of chunk or group your learning that way, okay? I do this even in my live classes. I'll do this for the students. It's more work for me, but it's much more help for you guys, right, in terms of grouping your learning or organizing your learning, uh, especially when you're starting out, okay? Now, eventually, maybe when we get to practice test number three or four, right, I'll kind of do things in order, Right, just to kind of give you guys a sort of, you know, help you guys kind of notice the sort of difference, right, between that sort of lecture style, yeah, and this one that I'm about to give, okay? So those are the sort of two sort of main things logistically that I wanted to mention, right, to get you guys, to prepare you guys for what you guys are about to do. The last thing is, you guys, the third thing is, guys, uh, get a notebook, right? Uh, get a notebook, a workbook. If you guys are using an iPad or like some sort of thinking pad, right, uh, you just write in your, with a stylus, just write in your digital pad. <laughs> I'm old, so technology is kind of like, it, it eludes me. But write in your digital device, that's perfectly fine, right? If you want to go old school and you printed out your test, you can write on your test, right? Um, and also, if you want to get a separate notebook, Right, to kind of take a collection of notes there so you have one source to refer to over and over again, do that as well. Key thing is, you guys, yeah, take notes, okay? There's a lot of things that I'm going to be throwing at you guys in these explanations, especially for those of you guys who've never studied grammar before, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of new terminology, right? And I'll explain the terminology in a lot of detail in the concept portion, the concept lectures. This is the practice test explanation lectures. Right, so I will introduce you to some of these concepts, but I won't dive deep. I won't give you as thorough of an explanation on a lot of these grammar concepts, though. Okay? Maybe I will in the beginning, but especially as we get later on in practice test two and three, it's your job to kind of be able to recognize right, what concept, um, you know, or what grammar term that is, right, and what that means, right, how it's used and stuff in the sentence. Okay? Um, all right, you guys, so with that being said, you guys, yeah, grab your notebooks, grab your pencils, and let's go ahead and dive in and dissect this practice test. Okay, so what I, what I also want to do for you guys is, look, I want to give you guys the most amazing experience, right, um, the most amazing sort of test prep experience that you guys have had digitally. Right now, I can't see, I wish I could see you guys in person and really interact with you guys and build a relationship with you guys person to person, but I can't, you know, and so I'm going to try my best, right, to give you guys, to kind of read your minds, right, and really think about, really try to understand you and really understand what you need, right, what I think that you need um, to help you guys to really, really exceed, right, uh, excel on this test, okay? So the very first thing that I do want to mention, you guys, is I want to give you some just general overall test taking strategies or tips. So these are the exact strategies that I use that allow me, right, to basically, uh, I, I can't tell you guys that I never miss a question, right, on a practice test or on a test, uh, I, but I can tell you guys that it's been a while since I've missed a question, right? So it's maybe about every, for the SAT, it's like maybe one out of every six tests, 
where I'll get like one wrong, right, on a practice test, right? And that might be because of, I don't know, some mistake that I made in my thinking or whatever it might be. But so I can tell you that I get every single question right all the time, right? But I do get a lot of the questions right most of the time, right? So I'm, I'll miss about one every six exams or so, right? And that's just me being totally honest with you guys, right? Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect though, right? But basically, you guys, the reason why I'm able to be so successful is because I've developed habits and strategies and tools, right, that I really implement when I'm te taking tests. And so these are the sort of top three that I'm going to share with you guys right now. There's a ton more. These are the top three that I think are the most important to at least begin or start your SAT journey. So the first thing, you guys, yes, please make sure that you're doing this, okay? Read to the end of the sentence while just making observations. So you understand that concept, you guys, yeah? Read to the end of the sentence, and as you're reading to the end of the sentence, you're just noticing things. In other words, you're not trying to solve the question as you read. It's one of the biggest mistakes that students will make on this test, right? So as they read, they're trying to figure out what that blank is as they're reading, you know, when they're not even finished reading to the end of the sentence. Guys, I promise you what'll happen is if you only read up to a certain part of the sentence and don't read to the end, you're not going to be able to see something, right, or recognize something that's really important for your answer, okay? So in other words, you're going to end up choosing the incorrect answer a lot of the times, okay? So don't try to figure out the answer as you read. Instead, read to the end of the sentence while just making observations. Tip number two, you guys, yeah? This is when you're reading the passage the first time through. Okay, so when you're reading the passage, right, before you even look at your answer, uh, before you even look at the answer choices, um, what I want you to do is I want you to fill in the blank with answer choice A as you read. So whatever answer choice A is, when you're reading the passage the first time through, yeah, you're just taking whatever A says and you're using that in the blank. And then you're reading to the end of the sentence while just making observations or notes. Okay? And then the third, so, this is important to you guys, yeah? Because look, our brains are completion machines. Our brains hate when things are left incomplete. We love to fill stuff in. Our brain needs to feel like it's, it, we, we have finished something. So, so to just read a blank as like a blank, right? It's going to confuse the heck out of you and it's going to make your brain kind of like struggle or feel agitated, right? So don't do that. Instead, just fill in whatever A says into that blank and just read to the end of the sentence, okay? The third high-level tip, you guys, this one's so important, so important, not just for the writing section but also for the reading section. And this is you always, you always want to work at a speed that allows you to process the information, okay, as well as, yeah, you always want to do things at a pace and a speed that makes you feel like you're in control. Hey kids, welcome back to your DSAT Writing Foundations classroom, where I help you to master the grammar fundamentals to help take you from unstuck and unsure to unstoppable, right, on the digital SAT exam. Now guys, um, we are going to talk about the last two question types or concepts, right? Now these two question types appear at the end of the writing section for all of the practice exams, right? Those are the transition questions and rhetorical synthesis questions. Okay, now these two question types or concepts, you guys, yeah, tend to be the most, uh, well, I guess, for some students, they tend to be the most challenging, right? And what I want to do is really try to help simplify these concepts or question types and really tell you guys, guys, it's not that hard, right? You just have to keep some principles in mind. One of those principles that you have to keep in mind and follow right, is you have to be able to do things or process things one thing at a time. The moment that you start to try to do two or three things at once, right, it's too much information for your mind to process, right? For most students, especially when you're under pressure on the actual test day, right? So processing one thing at a time really, really helps, right? It helps you to stay focused. It helps you with your comprehension, right? And it also helps you just to feel like you're in control, okay? So uh, with transition questions, it's no different. Remember, you guys, a transition is nothing more than a relationship between two ideas, right? Um, so uh, if, if I gave you these two ideas, 
right? I'm using the same examples. I'll change these up in future lessons, but I'm using the same ones on purpose, right? You'd be like, oh yeah, I remember that. And I remember why I need a trend, what kind of transition I need, right? Is that so that your mind kind of like understands the concept well, right? With the same examples before we move on to slightly different ones though, okay? So if I tell you that, hey, Jack is a six foot inch, six foot six inch behemoth, right? You, you, in your mind, if you just kind of comprehend or wrap your mind around that first, you'll be like, oh wow, Jack is huge. He's huge, right? He's physically, physically very, very intimidating almost, right? If he's a behemoth, think about that word. Not just saying a six foot six inch man or a six foot six inch boy. I'm using the word behemoth. What kind of image or meaning does that convey to you? That he's big, like a monster, right? Yeah, so he's physically very intimidating, right? So wrapping your head around that first before we move on to the second idea, which says he has a warm and sensitive side. When you understand, when you pause for a moment and wrap your head around this, what kind of images do you, uh, are, are, what kind of images are conveyed? What kind of meaning is conveyed, right? Well, if I say he's warm and sensitive, I get this sort of like he's soft. Right, he's very kind, right? His personality is very different from his physical stature, right, is all, yeah? So understanding, again, transitions being a relationship between two ideas, your job is to figure out, well, what transition word best captures that relationship between these two ideas? Would I say, therefore, right? Jack is six foot six inch behemoth, therefore, he has an uncharacteristically warm and sensitive side. Does that make logical sense? Because of this, Jack is this? <laughs> Not at all, right? Don't be delusional, you guys, yeah? Um, but if I did say, what if I said this? Jack is a six foot six, six inch monster, right? Therefore, many of his peers are afraid of him. You're like, oh yeah, that could be a cause and effect relationship, right? The second thing, people being afraid of him could result from the fact that Jack is so huge, right? That could be okay, right? but not in this case, you guys, right? So again, it is which transition is going to be okay, right? So keys to understanding this, you guys, right, is really um, understanding context, right? Processing the information one at a time, right? And also learning how these transition words are used precisely right? Like knowing and knowing like the different synonyms of different transition words, right? Like, you know, words like therefore, right, is synonymous with as a result, is synonymous with thus, as uh, consequently, right? Those kind of things, you guys, yeah? It's starting to learn how to organize your thinking around transition words though, right? I kind of dive into that a little bit more deeply, right, in the transitions concept lectures, because um, this, we can't get into that in too much detail here, but that's what you want to kind of train yourself to do, okay? So let's get into this, you guys, yeah? Under let's understand the context. Again, context is key. We got to understand what the meaning that's being conveyed, right? Um, to really be able to capture or understand the relationship, right, between these two ideas though, okay? So this, by the way, the transition questions are question numbers 28, 29, and 30, just back to back to back, okay? So this question reads, small flat structures called spatulae are found at the tips of the hairs on a spider's legs. Think about what that means. Right? This is basically the spatulae are a feature of the spider's legs. Can you visualize that? Spider's legs, yeah, they have spatulae, right? These spatulae temporarily bond with the atoms of whatever they touch. Let's wrap our minds around that. The sort of feature on the spider's legs, it sticks. It sticks to right, um, whatever they touch. Okay, so if we try to capture the idea here before this transition sentence, we have the con the the topic is about the spatulae. This is going to be a part of the uh, the spider's leg, and it's very sticky, right? It's got this sort of it bonds with whatever atoms they touch, right? That's understanding that guy well before we move on to this guy. Then it says spiders are able to cling to and climb almost any surface. So this now, the second sentence or the second idea, it, it's really about the topic of spiders and what they're able to do, right? They're able to what? They're able to climb and cling. They can cling and climb, right? They can cling and climb to almost any surface, okay? Cool. You guys get the idea? 
right? So here we have, again, information about the spatulae, which are part of the spider's legs, and they have this bonding ability. Okay, now that bond, so that they're, they're sticky. Now the spiders are able to cling to and climb any surface, right? They can actually stick to, right, any surface though. So think about the relationship here, you guys, yeah? Can you see the cause and effect here? Can you see it? So remember, cause and effect, can, you can think about cause and effect in like these two, these two different ways, right? You could say something like, because, because of one, right? Two is the case. You could do it like that, right? So because spatulae, right, are very sticky, right? So because of these spatulae that are very sticky and on the spider's leg, because of that feature of the spider, because of that, right, spiders can cling and climb to anything. That makes logical sense, right? Because these spatulae are very sticky. They can bond with anything they touch, right? So we can do it, we can think about it like that in terms of cause and effect, right? When we have this sort of therefore as a result thing, cause and effect, or we can think about it like this. We can say that two, two is the result, right? Two is the result of one, right? So <clears throat> basically this, the spiders, ability to cling and climb is the result or results from their spatulae that they have on their legs that are very sticky. That also makes logical sense too, right? As cause and effect. Yeah? Okay. So now based off of that, you guys, right? We would have to, we would have to say that, hey, ba-bam, D would have to be our correct answer, right? As a result is like, it, it's, it's one of those effect, it's a cause and effect relationship. It's similar to like therefore or consequently, uh, accordingly, right? Um, as a result, well, that's that. Thus, hence, right? All sort of synonymous, okay? Um, so D would have to be correct, right? Now, I think that if you got this question wrong, well, first of all, I don't think anybody chose the contrasting word, right? Because there isn't really expressing like a difference of ideas here. Um, Something with like sticky or not sticky or slippery, there's no sort of difference of ideas. So we can't, I don't think anybody chose that one, right? Uh, a, maybe some of you guys chose, but the reason why A, you guys cannot be correct is, for instance, it's gonna give you an example of what was mentioned in the previous point. Well, the previous point is about spatulae and their sticky ability, right? And their stickiness. The second sentence is about spiders. It's not about the spatulae, right? So the second sentence is not giving you an example of the spatulae's ability to bond with whatever atoms they touch, right? So because of that, we cannot use the for instance, okay? Now, if, if, a, is the, if a was the correct answer, if a was correct, right, then the second sentence, this sentence here would have to give us an example of spatulae, right, of spatulae and its ability to bond with the atoms of whatever they touch, right? So if we said something... Hey, welcome back, you guys. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into, right, like this last lesson, breaking down or dissecting uh, the second module for practice test number two. We have the last two sort of question types to cover, right, which are the rhetoric questions, transition questions, and rhetorical synthesis. Now remember, you guys, for transition questions, context is key. But in this case, right, it's not really looking for punctuations and stuff, but it's more about understanding, right? Understanding the context is really, really important, right? Remember, the high, at a high level, you want to understand first the independent clause, right, and really try to process things one thing at a time. Right, understand this first independent clause, right? Understand how the information progresses, right? Before you kind of look at the next, uh, the information of the sentence with the transition and also the transition answer choices too though, okay? So always make sure to be processing things one thing at a time, right? Um, and also take some time, right? Outside of class and practice tests to learn some common transitions. You guys have probably seen a lot of the same transitions appear as answer choices. Spend some time studying those, okay? Learning those precisely. Guys, I have a little test for you here. What's the perfect transition to use, right? Between to link these two sentences, right? We have Jack doesn't want people to treat him like a kid. He feels like, he feels he should get a Ching King's treatment. The correct transition here would have to be uh, 
word like instead or rather, right? So these kind of words, you guys, yeah, they will introduce an alternative, right, to the previous topic. So what's the topic about? The topic has to be the same, right? The topic is this. The topic, you can think about, think about the topic as like a question, right? Like, uh, how does Jack want people to treat him? Now, usually when you use words like instead or rather, the first sentence is going to be what's called a negative statement, right? Negative, not like in terms of like its connotation or its meaning, but like negative, not using negative words like mean or stupid that's like, or pessimistic, right? Those are negative words. But negative statement just means like using words like not or never or only, rarely, seldomly, right? So here, if I say Jack does not want people to treat him like a kid, well, then how does he want people to treat him? It's going to give you the alternative of how he wants to be treated. He wants to be treated like a king is all, right? So that's really how this sort of instead or rather would work. Just a little quiz I thought that I'd throw your way before we get into the real stuff, you guys, yep. Yeah? So the transition questions here would be question numbers 29 through 30, right? Four of these guys. Let's dive in, you guys. So here, the passage reads, um, CNA's 2013 novel, right? America Chronicles the Divergent Experiences of If Melu and Obinze, a young Nigerian couple after high school. Okay, so remember, understanding context. Don't get distracted by all of this hard language. The SAT is doing that on purpose. Untrained test takers are going to spend their time thinking about chim am manda negozi adichi. They're spending too much time there. Well-trained test takers are going to be like, okay, CNA's 2013 novel, this book. What does this book do? It chronicles the divergent experiences of these two people. They're a young Nigerian couple, right, after high school. That's what a trained test taker will do. Okay. Now, so we got what the book is about. It's about these two people, right? It kind of tells you what their experiences will be after high school. So we have this person, if moves to the U.S. to attend a prestigious university, right? Uh, Obi, Obi travels to London, hoping to start a career there. Okay. So you think about you guys, yeah? Uh, what's going on here? Well, it seems like how the information progresses is they're giving us details about the characters of these books, right? Um, yeah, so it's basically the whole book, right, is really about giving us details about these two characters' lives after high school, after high school. This next sentence kind of gives us the details of one of the characters and what this person did after high school. Right? This person moved to the U.S., this next sentence is also giving us an, the other character, what the other character did after high school. This person traveled to London, is all, right? So it seems like, hey, both the relationship here is just talking about what both of these characters did after high school, you know, is all, right? So here, uh, the I'm going to jump to the correct answer. The correct answer would have to be, right, something like A, okay? Meanwhile. So meanwhile, you guys, right, learn this transition. It has two different uses. So one of the uses, it could mean like at the same time. Actually, it takes too long to write it. But if I say at the same time, it's one of the uses of meanwhile. So I say this, if I say, um, uh, uh, Jack is studying for his test. Yeah. Meanwhile, his mom is cooking dinner, right? So this really kind of means like, hey, these are two things that are occurring at the same time, at the same time. And that's really how this information, how the meanwhile is being used here, right? These two events, right? Uh, if moving to the U.S. and OB moving to London, these are two events that are occurring at, at the same time, right? After high school, right? That's how this is being used. Meanwhile could also be used to mean like in the meantime, right? So like in other words, like while something is gonna happen or is, is waiting to happen, right? So for example, if I say something like this, guys, I start, I move to Hawaii. I will move to Hawaii next week. So this event hasn't happened, right? It's something that will happen. Then I say, meanwhile, I am in Korea recording this video, right? So meanwhile can also be used to express like in the meantime, right? In the, in, in the time intervening. So while something else is expected to happen, so I'm expecting to move next week, right? While that while that's expected to happen, this is something that's going on, right? So I am in Korea recording this video, right? Is um, the thing that's occurring now, right? In the meantime, you know, is all. Okay, so it, meanwhile could also be used in that way, all right? So uh, here, 
we know it's used at the same time is all, right? And the context really tells us that, yeah? Um, now, in terms of incorrect answers, you guys, yeah, first and foremost, I think the in fact here, obviously wrong. If this were true, right, this second sentence has to be about if. It has to really emphasize something that if did, right, the previous sentence, but it doesn't do that at all, right? So we know we can cross out D for sure, right? Now, what about C? Secondly, you guys, yeah, think about how this is used. First, second, right, lastly, next. These are used, these are what are called sequence transitions. Sequence is stuff, you know, it, it, it's steps, right, in, in, in some sort of explanation, right? It's like events that occur in some kind of order, right? That's what a sequence is, yeah? And so you would use these kind of transitions to explain a sequence, right? So if I say, first, I uh, went home, right, second, right? I, I don't know, I, I, I went to bed, I took a nap, right? That would be like a sort of sequence transition, right? But can you see how here there is, like this context is not really explaining a sequence or like an order of events, right? It's not really talking about how what happened first and what happened next. It's more so talking about this, these two things, these two people, right? What they did at the same time, right? What they did after high school, right? One went here, one went here right? And so we know that secondly can't be used in that way, right? So we know that, hey, we can cross out C as well. And then nevertheless, remember, this is going to be used to introduce something unexpected given the previous information. But Obi traveling to London is not unexpected given the fact that if moved to the U.S. It doesn't have that kind of relationship, right? Whether it's expected, right? Whether Obi travels to London, right? Whether that information, it, guys, it's that information is not expected. It doesn't make logical sense that he would move to London because if moved to the US. It's also not logical to think that this is unexpected. Right? It's also not logical to think that, hey, Obi traveling to London, right, um, is unexpected given the fact that if moved to the US. That's also not logical to think that way either. Right? There is no relationship, right? There is no sort of correlation. It's just, it just so happens that it's random, right? It just so happens that if moved to the US and OB moved to London, right? So we can't use nevertheless there. Like I told you guys time and time again, you guys, yeah? When nevertheless is correct, when it's used correctly, it'll be obvious. It'll be clear to you that this information is unexpected given the previous information. Students will just kind of like, they will, mis they will misunderstand this one because they're thinking like, oh yeah, I had no idea that Obi would travel to London. They're like, oh, that's totally unexpected, <laughs> right? But it, there has to be a logical connection between this and this. And there isn't a logical connection of unexpectance, right, between the two sentences. There is no connection, is the thing, okay? So don't misunderstand how that word is being used, okay? Next, you guys, is number, two, number 28. Here we have, organisms have evolved a number of surprising adaptations to ensure their survival in adverse conditions. Let's pause for a moment to think about what this is saying. So we really have, we have a lot. Hey, welcome back, you guys. Uh, let's go ahead and break down this third section, right, of practice test number three, that first module. So guys, to add a little bit more um, to the rhetorical synthesis points, the high-level points, right, uh, remember, well, I think a couple of things, you guys. Remember, comprehension is really key, right? So being able to comprehend not just what it says, but also what it's doing, its relationship to other details. Stop. What's the point, right? Being able to recognize information that kind of stands out, right, um, it, it is really important. Also, though, you guys, I wanted to add a couple more things. These are things that I've been kind of like, you know, emphasizing the last few lessons for rhetorical synthesis questions. But remember, you know, comparing answer choices is a very powerful tool, right? So, you know, if, if you're not sure, you know, if you're not 100% sure that one answer is wrong, we'll keep it and now compare that to another answer choice, right? In terms of which one does a better job, right, of answering the question that's being asked of you to answer. And also, you guys, you know, following the flow of information, right? So what I mean by the flow of information is understanding how these notes kind of like progress, right? How they kind of move or flow, right, from first note to second, third, fourth, and so on and so forth, though, okay? Because you'll start to kind of get an idea or a sense, right, as to what the sort of 
I don't know, the main topic, right, or the sort of important, you know, point, right, that the, 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 the writer uh, wants to kind of focus on, right, in terms of whatever notes that he's talking about, though, okay? So following the flow of information is going to be important. Yeah, I've been doing that just like intuitively when I give my explanations, right? Uh, but this is kind of what I mean by following the flow of information. Yeah, I'll give you guys a couple examples of it here. So question number 28, you guys. Sam Maloof was an American uh, woodworker and furniture designer. So we know that this is just the stuff that he did, and we know that he used to, he, he worked with wood. He's like a craftsman, right? He was a son of Lebanese immigrants. Okay, so he came from another country. He received the Genius Grant from the John D. and Catherine MacArthur Foundation in 1985. So a Genius Grant is like really some kind of like scholarship that he received, right? But really though, that grant is going to be because of the work that he's doing as that furniture designer, right? As that woodworker, right? So this is kind of what I mean, like an example of following the flow of information. It's not that this detail is completely random, right? Like this detail kind of relates, right, to what was talked about previously, you know, is all, yeah? So this genius work is telling you that he's really talented at something. It's not that he's super talented at like computer coding, right? But it's kind of relates to what was talked about. This is what I mean. This is like an example of following the flow of information, right? Understanding how they kind of connect, right? Connecting the dots, right? These sort of points or concepts. Um, the Museum of Fine Arts owns a rocking chair that Maloof made uh, from walnut wood. Okay, so it really shows you his talent, right? A museum kind of kept it. They own it. The, the armrests and the seats of the chair are sleek and contoured, and the back consists of seven spindle-like slacks. So the armchairs and the, the armrests and the seat of what chair? Of the chair in the museum. Another example of following the flow of information, right? Anywho, something that you just want to be aware of, and I think, you know, the students who operate or who work at a very high level who find these questions to be relatively easy are kind of doing that naturally. But if you guys like haven't ever thought about doing that, right, or weren't kind of connecting the dots or, you know, following the flow, right, like intentionally, you can start kind of doing that or keeping that in mind. That might help to make things a little bit easier for you to understand. Now, it says, the student wants to describe the rocking chair to an audience unfamiliar with Sam Maloof. Okay. So basically, what does the correct answer have to do? Well, the correct answer has to tell us what the rocking chair looked like, right? Especially, well, to, uh, uh, it has to tell us what the rocking chair looked like, right? Give us details about its look, its appearance. I also have to make, has to mention maybe some kind of, has to make some kind of mention, I think, right, of the, the creator of it. Because if we don't know who Sam Maloof is and we read a sentence without the creator of this chair, right, it wouldn't really be clearly, right, um, kind of accomplishing that goal. Okay, so with that being said, let's dive into our answer choices. So A says, with its sleek contoured armrest and seat, the walnut rocking chair in Boston's Museum of Fine Art is just one piece of furniture created by American woodworker Sam Maloof. Looks pretty good, right? We know what the chair looks like, and we also know, if we're unfamiliar with Sam Maloof, we know that he created it. Looks pretty good, right? Okay. Doesn't mean we're going to keep it, though, but we have something to measure or compare other ants' choices to. So here, Sam Maloof was born in 1916 and died in 2009. And during his life, he made a chair that you can see if you visit the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Guys, if we compare A to B, which one is clearer in terms of giving us details about the chair? Definitely A, right? Guys, this part here, he made a chair that you can see. This is just too general. It's too vague, right? It's not as clear or as precise as this, right? It actually tells you what that chair looks like. This just kind of tells you that you can see the chair at a place, right? It tells you where you can see a chair. This tells you not only what the chair looks like, right? But also you know where it's at as well, right? And so A does a much better job than B. So now we can get rid of B. We can get rid of answer choice B when we compare it to A, right? And if we look at C, uh, I think C is going to be super obviously wrong, right? There's no details about the chair, right? There's no details about that rocking chair, right? So what rocking chair? There's no mention of that in C, so C is going to be a thousand percent wrong. Now D, the rocking chair is made from walnut and it has been shaped such that its armrests and seat are sleek and contoured. So yeah, D compared to A, 
right? They both kind of talk about or describe the rocking chair, right? In terms of its details or what it looks like. But which one is better, you guys? Which one does a more full or complete job of answering the question, accomplishing the goal? That would have to be A. Well, why? Because we know, right, if we're unfamiliar with Sam Maloof, yeah, and that if we're unfamiliar with him, we have no idea who he is, well, we still have no idea who he is in D, right? But we do know who he is in A, right? So A does a much better job, right, of accomplishing that goal, describing the rocking chair to an audience that's unfamiliar, right, with Sam Maloof, right? So this is why, you guys, A would have to be the correct answer, right, for this question. Now, moving on, you guys, to question number 29, is let's follow the flow of information. Let's connect the dots, right? Let's comprehend. So many different ways to say the same thing. Um, in the late 1890s, over 14,000 unique varieties of apples were grown in the US. A lot of different types of apples, wowzers. The rise of industrial agriculture in the mid 1900s narrowed the range of commercially grown crops. So basically, following the flow of information, we don't have as many. We don't have as many as we did, right, in the late 1890s, okay? Um, and it's really talking about the reason for it, right? This is the cause of it, yeah? Um, thousands of apple varieties considered less suitable for commercial growth were lost. So basically, a lot of these unique varieties disappeared. Follow the flow, right? Today, only 15 apple varieties dominate the market, making up 90% of apples purchased in the US. Get the idea, yeah? I'm giving us more details about how there aren't as many varieties, right? Um, there's only 15, in fact, present day, yeah? And the Lost Apple Project, based in Washington State, uh, attempts to find and grow lost apple varieties. This is cool. So it kind of introduces a company and it tells us about their mission, right? To really try to recover um, some of these lost apple varieties though, right? Um, and they're actually gonna grow it. They wanna reintroduce it is all, okay? So once we kind of wrap our minds or our heads around that, let's jump into that question stem, you guys, yeah? So it says, the student wants to emphasize the decline, wants to emphasize the decline in unique apple varieties in the US and specify why this decline occurred. So guys, it's, I don't know if I mentioned this or made this clear to you before, but it's totally possible that <clears throat> the correct answer has to actually accomplish two goals or more than one goal, right? So it's important that you identify, right, the goals, in this case, right, sometimes more than one, the goals that the SAT wants, the goals that the correct answer has to achieve or accomplish. So in this case, what's the first goal? Well, we have to have information, the correct answer has to tell us or emphasize the decline in unique apple varieties. So it has to tell us, right, really um, just how, you know, apple varieties, how apple varieties are declining, right? How there's fewer and fewer apple varieties, right, um, in the world. And that's their first thing. And in the U.S., sorry, not in the world, but in the U.S., and it also has to specify why this decline occurred. So what's the reason, right, that there are so few apple varieties? Okay, so our correct answer has to accomplish or, or satisfy both of these goals. Let's jump into the answer choices, you guys. Hey guys, welcome back to your DSAT Writing Foundations classroom, where I help you guys to master the grammar fundamentals to help take you guys from unstuck and unsure to unstoppable, right, on this test. Now guys, let's go ahead and dissect the other sort of grammar concepts, right? We're talking about verbs, apostrophes, and modifiers were the three other grammar concepts tested on this test. Now remember you guys, right, um, <clears throat> taking a quick glance at the answer choices to try to determine, at least to a certain degree, right, like what type, at least one concept they're testing you on right, um, can be really, really powerful or helpful, yeah? Um, you, will you get it right all the time? Well, not necessarily, right? But, you know, at least you have a starting point, right? And so if you kind of have, if you kind of have an idea, if I tell you guys, guys, this question number 21 is testing you on commas. Is it gonna make you read the, 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 the passage a little bit differently? Then if I said, guys, this question is testing you on transitions. It is, right? And so, guys, it's a nice little thing to do, right? It doesn't take a long time to do so, yeah? And you don't want to, it doesn't, it shouldn't be too stressful. Like, don't worry if you can't quite figure it out, right? It's perfectly fine. 
And don't say like, you know, I don't complain and say, oh, Jen, you know, I looked at this for like one minute and I couldn't figure it out. I was so stressed out. It's all your fault. I messed up the test. I'm not talking about that, you know, guys, but I'm just really telling you, it's like, hey, be smart about it, right, is all. Um, at least it kind of having a little bit more knowledge or information is always a good thing, right? Um, and especially if you kind of have a starting point, it kind of, you know, might lead you in the sort of right direction, right? It might kind of change the way that you kind of do things, which might again increase the sort of chances you're getting things correct though, right? Is all, okay? So here, testing you on commas. There were two comma questions in this module, question number 21 and 22, right? Back to back comma questions. So here it says, um, both Sona Char, an Indian American, and Doniel Clayton, an African American, grew up frustrated by the lack of diverse characters in books for young people. In 2011, these two writers joined forces to found Cake Literary, a book packaging company specializes in the creation and promotion of stories told from diverse perspectives for children and young adults. Okay, so guys, here, they're testing us on two concepts here, right? When it, when it dealing with commas. So the first thing that I want you guys to do, right, is I want you guys to circle the word that, okay? And next to this, write down uh, this that clause, right? So this that clause, yeah, is you're gonna see this all over all, all the time, right? A lot of the time when they're testing you on um, commas and, and sentence structure. These that clauses, right? These guys are a type of dependent clause. Now they can be used, right, to come after like a noun, like, a, like an object, right? The company that hires people from around the world. So these that clauses can be used to kind of describe which company we're talking about, right? Or like which noun we're talking about. So if I say the, 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 the car that my brother owns, right? That my brother owns is really answering that question, well, which car, right? So it can be used in that way where it kind of modifies that noun that comes before it right? It can also be used after like a verb, right? If I say, oh, my mom says that students are great, right? My mom believes that I need to shower more, right? Um, you know, and so that's another use of the that clause too, right? But guys, both anyways, these that clauses, they're, they're both a type of dependent clause, right? Now, another sort of characteristic to know about these that clauses, you guys, is that they're always considered to be essential information. They're always essential, Right, so essential means, right, we don't put commas before the that clause or after the that clause or around the that clause. These are always essential parts of the sentence is all, right? And so that's one sort of thing that they're testing you on when it comes to the that clause for this question, right? So it says a book packaging company that specializes in the creation and promotion of stories, right? So that specializes in this is just kind of like telling you or describing modifying, right, which book packaging company we're talking about. Are we talking about the book packaging company that my brother owns? No. Am I talking about the book packaging company that um, Jeff Bezos started? <laughs> no. I'm talking about this book packaging company that specializes in this, right? So in that sense, you guys, yeah, these guys are going to be considered to be essential information, which means we don't put a comma before it, right? So knowing that, we know that we can cross out D here for sure, okay? Now, here's another thing that you want to know about these that clauses, okay? Is that sometimes the word that is going to be invisible. So sometimes you might have what I call the invisible that clause, right? The invisible that clause, okay? Now, sometimes it's, it's, it, it's optional. Sometimes. Not always, but sometimes, right? So, for example, you guys, if I say, if I say this, if I say, um, my mom says that I need to study more. That's the exact same thing as saying, my mom says I need to study more. Okay, so sometimes, so they're both grammatically correct. Right, so sometimes you'll see the word that in there, and sometimes you'll see it invisible. Okay, but in that case, that's acceptable. Right, when I say my mom says I need to shower more, right, and my mom says that I need to shower more, they're both grammatically okay. Right, but still, so sometimes the idea is sometimes you might see the word that in there, other times you won't. Even if, but here's the thing, even if it's not there, even if the word that isn't there, you don't put a comma before the invisible that clause, right? So it's always essential, even if that word that is invisible, right? It's what you have to kind of understand or know, okay? And lastly, you guys, is sometimes, right? Sometimes 
you 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 have to have the word that in there, right? So in this case, the reason why I need the word that in there is because if I don't have it, right, I have um, I have a run-on sentence, right? So here if I say a book packaging company, okay, so wait, actually, before I get into that, you guys, yeah? So if I tell you guys that it's still essential, right, then we know that we can get rid of this guy here as well, okay? Anywho, if I say a, yeah, I'll kind of talk about that in just a second though, okay? So here now, if I look at C, if I say a book packaging company specializes in the creation of and promotion of stories told from diverse perspectives, okay? If I get rid of the word that here, you guys, yeah, can you see how it affects the structure of the sentence? So basically, if you look at C here, it's gonna create a run-on sentence. Well, how do I know? Well, if I get rid of the word that here, it still makes sense. If I say a book packaging company specializes in this. A book packaging company specializes in the creation and promotion of stories. That's a complete sentence, right? So here, the word specializes is gonna function as a verb, right? But now in this case, if I have the sentence written like this, now if I start from a book packaging company all the way to the end of the sentence, I'm gonna have an independent clause. Why is that a problem? Well, if I look at the information before the comma, I'm also gonna have another independent clause. These two writers joined forces to found Cake Literary. Another I see, right? So I'm gonna have two independent clauses that are separated by just a comma. And that's gonna create that run-on sentence, that sentence structure error, right, that I showed you guys about, right? So that's why, you guys, yeah, that, hey, we gotta get rid of, we can't choose something like C here, okay? Now, <clears throat> yeah, so that's why, yes, C is gonna be incorrect, okay? Now, if you guys are choosing C, it's really because you're only reading this part of the sentence. You're not really considering the other parts of the sentence, right? Mainly this part here, right? So make sure you guys, that you're checking all parts of the sentence, right? Because sometimes when you think that something makes sense here in only this one part, it could create another error in some other part of the sentence, you guys, yeah? And that's really what's happening here, okay? So that really just shows you, right, that you need the word that in here. Because why? Now if I say a book packaging company that specializes, now it turns this into a dependent clause, right? Not an independent clause. And now we can have a sentence structure that goes like this, right? That's gonna be perfectly fine. And that's what you see here, okay? So that's why you guys, yeah? Uh, answer choice B would have to be the correct answer, right? B would have to be the correct answer for this question, okay? So it's kind of nice to kind of see this, that clause. Uh, the SAT didn't test this as much as the ACT did, but the SAT seems like they're starting to do it, so it's great. All right, question number 22, you guys. The sentence reads, a study led by scientist Rebecca Kirby at the University of Wisconsin-Madison found that black bears that eat human food before hibernation have increased levels of a rare carbon isotope, carbon-13, due to the higher level 13C levels in corn and cane sugar. Bears with these elevated levels were also found to have much shorter hibernation periods on average. Okay, guys. So first thing...